Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. I'm your humble host and grammar detective, Paul Duke. We haven't been streaming for the last two weeks, two months, actually. And I apologize for that. And thank you for returning to the show with me. I took a little break to have some surgery done on an old injured knee, but now I'm feeling strong and healthy and excited as we enter the spring and summer season of the show. So welcome back. If you're a previous viewer, welcome back. If you're a new viewer, welcome to our show. Now, on this show, I answer your questions about English grammar and help you solve these mysteries. And we can do that several ways. You can send me a video clip and I'll post my uh, email address shortly. You can send me a short one minute video clip and I'll build a show around your question if you don't mind appearing on the show. Or live on the show, you can ask questions. Now tonight we don't have any prepared video clip questions, so I'm gonna answer your questions live here. And we'll get to that shortly. But to start with, I want you to say hello and tell me what country you're watching from. Uh, if you're a new viewer, it's great to have a sense of where everyone is. Uh, first, I'd like to say hello to Chris Derboven, longtime viewer and friend of the show. Thank you and welcome back, Chris. We also have Facebook user, long time no see, yes. Now, if you're on a Facebook group uh, and you make a comment, I can't see your name. So that's why it says Facebook user, not your name, because you're watching in a Facebook group. If you go to my Facebook profile or my Facebook page or jump over to YouTube, I can see your name when you uh, uh, make a comment. I want to say hello also to Palavi. Palavi, I'm not sure how you pr prefer to have that pronounced, but welcome back. Welcome to the show again. We also have someone saying, hello, sir. Hello, whomever you are. What's your name and what country are you watching from? And thank you for joining me. Now, I have some questions for you tonight. Uh, because this is the first show of the season after the break, I want to try a few new things, including finding out a little bit more from you guys, what's the best day to watch this show? Now, usually, or the last year, I've done it on Friday evenings. But I do understand that Friday evenings is a problem for some people. Or, if you're in some parts of the world, that's Saturday morning. And if it's Saturday morning, you might have other activities to do. So I'm going to put that question out there in a few moments. Hello, Chris from Brazil. Welcome back to the show. <clears throat> Facebook user is Fuad from Morocco. Yes, I remember you, Fuad. Thank you for joining us again. Great to have you with us. Okay, awesome. So nice to have you guys back. I'm so excited to be back. Um, I had a difficult couple of months, to be honest with you. Um, surgery went well, but it was a long recovery, and I'm still doing a lot of therapy to rehabilitate my leg. But it's coming along very nicely, and I'm happy that I can finally stand up for a while and do the show. That, that has been a problem. Standing up was difficult for a while. Now uh, I'm feeling great about it, so it's time to do the show again. But I do want to approach the spring season a little differently with the show. I want to uh, make it more convenient for more people. Um, so what I'm going to ask everybody is this question. And I want you to type your answer in the comment box. What is the best day and best time for you to watch this show? Because I'm thinking about changing it to any possible day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, Sunday, morning, afternoon, nighttime. See, the challenge is, guys, I'm in Canada, and right now it's evening. But for some of you, it's morning. For some of you, it's late evening. And for others, it's late afternoon. So finding the perfect time is a challenge. But I want to find the best time for the most people to watch our show. So what do you think is the best day and time? Excuse me, I'm just going to get a little water. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's been a while since I spoke. Ah, Kumiko is with us. Hello, Kumiko-san from Japan. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. So, for example, for Kumiko, right now is Friday morning. 
for me, it's Thursday evening. So <clears throat> is this convenient time for Kumiko to watch the show? Maybe, maybe not. And I think for Chris in Brazil, it's later evening for her. Boy, my throat is giving me a hard time here. You'll have to excuse me. I haven't spoken so much in months. <clears throat> Maybe I need to have a surgery on my voice, never mind my leg. So give this some thought, guys. I want to know if you had the perfect dream, what's the best day for you to watch this show? Like a day when you're not working, you're not um, shopping, you're not out at a party, you're not with your family, you have some time to be online and watch the show. What's the best day and the best time for you? Kind of a survey. So getting some answers in here. Let's see. So if this is Fawad, I prefer to watch your show on Friday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. Okay, so Fuad is in Morocco. So what day and time is it right now, Fuad? Is it Saturday for you? See, Chris is in Brazil and Brazil is in South America. I'm in North America. So our times are pretty close, but hers is a little bit later. So for Chris, this is a convenient time, okay. How about you, Fuad? Is, what's the best time? So Friday and Saturday afternoon, your time, which is GMT, right? Okay, so again, the question is, what is the best time and the best day for you to watch my show? Live, this is live right now. And I want you guys to watch it live so that you can participate and ask me questions. Of course, you can always watch the recording, but I can't answer your questions. So I'm trying to find the best day and the best time. So it might be Thursday, it might be Friday. I want to make it the best time and day for everyone uh, so that we have more people joining us and participating. Okay, so Pallavi says it's 5.36 a.m. here. Uh, and by the way, where are you? What country are you in? I really wanted you to change the time of your live stream. I wish you'd do your live stream on Saturday afternoon or evening. Okay, this is interesting. This is helpful. So Saturday afternoon or evening, where you are is probably early Saturday morning for me. But I need you to tell me uh, where you are. I think I know and remember, but I want to be sure. So 1 a.m. in Belgium now. It's okay on Thursday or on Friday for Chris. Okay. So again, Pallavi, please tell me which country you're in or time zone. Because this is the problem, guys. We're all over the world. It's not a problem. It's fantastic. But all of our time zones are different, so it's a challenge. Okay, Pallavi's in India. Excellent. So if I'm not mistaken, if I'm correct, uh, right now it's early morning Saturday in India, right? It's early morning Friday, sorry, early morning Friday in India, 5.36 a.m. Friday morning. For me, in Canada, it's Thursday evening. So we have to be very, very specific here. Pallavi wants to change to Saturday afternoon or evening, which means early morning for me. Now that's okay. I can do that if it helps everyone be able to watch the show. So this is really helpful information, guys. Uh, 7 p.m. in Colombia. Uh, who's in Colombia? What's your name? And, and uh, Because I only see Facebook user because you're in a Facebook group, which is fine but I can't see your name if you comment from a Facebook group. If you comment from YouTube or my Facebook profile, I can see your name. So 7 p.m. in Colombia, is this a good time for you? Right? I want to know, guys, what is the best day and the best time for you to watch this show? So far we hear Thursday night's okay for Chris, uh, Chris in Belgium and Chris in Brazil. 
Uh, Pallavi wants it on Saturday. I think Fouad wants it on Saturday. So maybe we change it to Saturday. I mean, that's fine with me if everyone wants that. So Chris in Brazil and Chris in Belgium, would Saturday morning be okay for you? Right? If more people can watch it on Saturday afternoon in their part of the world, and in North and South America, that's Saturday morning, maybe that's a good choice. Ah, Luza. <clears throat> nice to see you, Luza. Thank you. So in Colombia, what's the best day and time for you to watch my show? Okay, so in Morocco, it's 1, 10 a.m. But what day? What day, 10 a, 1, 10 a.m.? This is the problem, guys. For me, it's Thursday. Right? For some of you, it's Friday. Okay, so Luza, this is convenient for you. Okay. Now, Luza, I know that you uh, also watch Eric's live stream on Sunday. And for me and you, it's Sunday morning. Um, is that a good time for you to watch my show if I moved it to Saturday or Sunday morning? I, I'm, this information is very helpful because <clears throat> in January, when we did our last live stream, uh, I think the last one or two, not many people watched it live. And, you know, that's a little disappointing because it's nice if everyone watches the recording later on YouTube, but... For me, it's most exciting to do it live, so I have lots of uh, viewers to participate with and to answer your questions. So the more people we can get watching live, um, the more important it is. And I am going to start doing a little promotion. Okay, so Luza, Sunday mornings is also great for you. Okay, how about Saturday? What do you think about Saturday? I love doing this show, by the way, guys. It's really fun for me. Uh, I enjoy it. I love meeting new viewers and hearing your questions and uh, finding out ways to help you understand grammar better and better. However, I have to also say, it does take a lot of work to put on this show every week, and it does cost money. So what I also want to think about this year is getting some sponsorship, uh, some corporate support for the show. Uh, because that will help pay the cost of the show. And one way I can do that is if I have more and more viewers. The more viewers I have, the more I can tell a company, hey, sponsor the show. Okay, Pallavi, that's nice. Well, I work during the day, my daytime, with my private students. So it's not really possible to do the show in the middle of the day, my time. That's why I have been doing this Thursday evening and Friday evening over the last three years because I have already finished with my private students because I do private tutoring online with students. Uh, and by the way, if anyone wants private help with their English, we can talk about that. So I do that during my daytime hours from early morning until, you know, 4, 5, 6 p.m. So after that, I can do my live stream. So... For me, my evening is the best time. But my evening is very late at night for my South American friends, and it's Friday morning or Saturday morning for my friends in Asia and the Middle East. And maybe it's not convenient for you. So I'm trying to find the best place for the viewers so that we can have the most viewers. Saturday evening is fine, okay. Okay, so during the day I'll be teaching. So, Luza, that's an example, right? A lot of people work on Saturdays. Some people work on Saturdays and Sundays. So, <clears throat> it's difficult to find the perfect spot, I understand. But, uh, yeah. So, one of the things I want to do this year, I'm going to try different times. So, pay attention to my ads and my social media posts, because it might not every week be Thursday. This is not necessarily a permanent choice. I want to try different times and see who watches, who can watch the show. So please pay attention to my social media and pay attention to the dates and times. And I always put the times in PST or PDT, which is Pacific time, which is my time zone. I'm afraid you'll have to calculate it for your time. 
And uh, again, this show does cost money, so if anyone is feeling generous, uh, there's a couple things I want to say. I do have some products coming out, such as uh, coffee cup mugs, Grammar Detective coffee mugs, and shirts and hats and stuff. We also have these nice notebooks that you can purchase. Um, and one way to do that is to go to this online shop. Where am I? This online shop and uh, purchase these products. Now, this money doesn't go in my pocket so I can live a fancy life. This money takes care of the cost of this show, takes care of the streaming costs, takes care of the lighting costs, uh, all of the costs it takes to run this show, including batteries, electricity, internet, all these things. So if you want to, you don't have to, you can certainly buy these products. Where am I? Yes, buy these products at my online store. You can also go to uh, buy me a coffee and make a donation of any amount. Could be a dollar, two dollars, thousand dollars if you're rich, doesn't matter. All that money helps pay for the show. So please think about, think about that. No pressure. Uh, I understand Money is important and money's tight. We're in a difficult economic time, but if you feel generous and you can spare a dollar or something, uh, buy me a coffee uh, is an easy, convenient way to donate some support to the show. I'll put this up later for you guys to check out again, but I uh, just want to mention that. In the meantime, there's another comment popping in. Yes, exactly. So there's the, uh, there's the link if you want to do that. I'll put the QR codes up again later. Okay, so now we've talked about the best date and time for the show. I also want to ask you another question, which is, what sort of grammar problems do you struggle with? What topics of grammar are you interested in learning more about? Because if you're interested in learning it ab about it, or if you have trouble with it, I want to help you. That's what the show is for. So let's see what you uh, guys have to say about grammar topics, grammar problems, grammar confusions. Yeah, so here's an example, right? In Pallavi's time zone, uh, her friends can't join the show. So maybe Saturday afternoon is a better time for you guys. Uh, however, I think in India, for me to stream Saturday afternoon, it's going to be 3 or 4 a.m. for me. That's a bit challenging, not because I sleep in. I wake up early anyway. But my wife might be asleep next door. And so I can't speak freely and loudly. So this is tricky, but we're going to work on it. Okay, figures of speech. Okay, great like idioms and metaphors and similes, right? These are, these are tricky things in English. I could do a whole show about idioms and uh, figurative language. You know, in, Engl uh, in all languages, we have two types of language. We have figurative, which is figures of speech, idioms, and so on. And we have literal language. Literal means you read the words and you, the meanings exactly what the words say. So that's basic grammar and basic English, basic vocabulary. Figurative language is more poetic and literary, so sometimes the meaning is not what the words say. Uh, by the way, my friend is from Russia. Okay, so that helps with our time zone. So for Pallavi in India, um, this time is okay. But for your Russian friend, this time is a, a tricky problem. Okay. Okay, so someone's offering promotion. Thank you, but uh, this is not the time and place for that, so... I'll just take you off the screen a little bit here. How do I get that off screen?
Yes, again, so this is, the, this is the question I'm asking you guys now. What part of English grammar is the most challenging or uh, confusing, confusing for you? What do you want to learn? Now, if you want to send me a video question, you can uh, record, you know, with your phone, a simple video of you asking the question, one minute long, no, no more, and then email it to me right here, hardboiledenglish6 at gmail, and I'll use it on the show and build the whole show around that topic. That's one way to ask a question. Another way is you can do it right here in the chat box. Okay, so now I'd like to know what your question is that maybe I can answer on the board now. Let me get out of my costume and uh, get into my work mode and we'll see what questions I can help you with tonight. So what is your grammar question? Guys, do you have any grammar questions that I can help you with? I have one that, I, that uh, somebody gave me earlier. Um, where is it now? Let me just get it in here. So while you guys think about your grammar questions that I can answer right here, I have one to start with. So one of my viewers sent me this question a couple of hours ago because they can't watch live tonight. And they're asking me, what is wrong with this sentence? I am seeking a new job. I guess they told somebody and somebody said that's wrong, but they don't understand why. So let's have a quick look at that on the board. I am seeking for a new job. Okay, well, the, the answer is kind of simple. It's related to this verb. I am seeking, that's the verb. And you, you could also say, uh, I will seek for a new job. That's a different tense. Let's say that's the future. I will seek, and again, the verb is seek. So what's the problem with this sentence? Well, the problem is this, the preposition for. The verb seek is a transitive verb. And verbs fall into two categories. They're transitive or they're intransitive, or some verbs can be both. But in this case, seek is always a transitive verb. What does that mean? It means we have to have the verb and right after it, we need a noun. We need the direct object. We need an object or a noun, and it can be a noun form. It can be a gerund, ing. It could be a noun phrase or clause, but it has to be an object. Why? Because you must seek something. Things are nouns. So another example of that is the verb uh, enjoy. You can't simply say, I will enjoy in English. You need to enjoy something, and that something must be a noun. But right after this verb, we have a preposition. After a transitive verb, you cannot have a preposition. Watch what happens when we remove it. I am seeking what? A new job. A new job, this is a noun. Well, Let's say this is an adjective, but job is the noun. That's the thing that I'm seeking. I'm seeking something, and some things are nouns. So I will seek a new job. So what's wrong with this sentence is, or was, that we had a preposition after a transitive verb. Can't do that. After a transitive verb, we need a direct object. I enjoy pizza. Pizza is a noun. I wouldn't say I enjoy with pizza. No, I enjoy pizza. 
So transitive verbs, intransitive verbs, very tricky for some language groups because some languages don't have transitive or intransitive verbs. English does. So it's a very important subject. In fact, uh, I've made an entire video series called English Weirdness, and I'm going to put a link to the episode that is devoted to transitive verbs. And if you really want to understand transitive and intransitive verbs, and they're important because they affect other parts of the sentence, right? They affect what comes after it. If it's a transitive verb, we have to be followed with a direct object or a noun. If it's intransitive, you don't need anything. And you can have a preposition. Okay? So if you want to study a little bit more of that, check out the link that I've just posted. And uh, that's that. That's the problem with seeking for. Another example of this is the verb discuss. A lot of people, a lot of learners will say discuss about a new job. No, discuss is a transitive verb. You must discuss something, a topic. Right now I'm discussing grammar. Grammar is a noun. I'm discussing English. I'm discussing a new job. Discuss is a transitive verb. It must be followed by a direct object. Direct objects are nouns. Okay? So let's see if someone else has a question. This is a, a common question that we get a lot. Adverbs. Adverbs have a lot of different locations, right? Um, they are movable. So it's hard to know where to put them. And there's not a clear rule about it because there are different types of adverbs and there are different types of positions. Um, I think, Chris, we've discussed this in the past um, and we can certainly devote a, a class to it, but um, if you're not sure, put the adverb close to the, the verb because an adverb modifies or tells us more information about the verb. So adverbs can move, but here's a little helping rule or tip. If you're not sure where to put it, get it close to the verb. So for example, a sentence like, uh, let's say, Yesterday she ate the pizza and she ate the pizza and what? What else did she do? She ate the pizza and sang a song. Okay? And let's say you want to add the adverb quickly. Right? Quickly is the adverb. And quickly's job is to change the meaning of the verb, right? So the question is going to be, where should we put it? We have a problem. Why? Because we have two verbs. So the first thing you have to understand is, which verb is this talking about? Did she ate quickly or did she sang quickly? It could, be it could be both. It could be either one of them is possible. I don't know the story here, but I think you're probably more likely to eat quickly than sing a song quickly. You sing the song however long the music is. You have to follow the music. So she probably did not sing quickly. So that means this one belongs to this verb. So if you're not sure, you could put it here or here. Now it might not be perfect, but it's pretty good, right? If you put it here, guess what? You create an ambiguous sentence, a sentence with no clear meaning, because at the end, it could be applying to that verb. Sorry. It could apply to that verb, or it could be applying to that verb, and the reader or the listener is not sure. So that's too far away. Don't put your adverb there. 
put it close to the verb so the listener or the reader knows it means this verb. It's applying to this verb. Now, there are more particular rules. This is what we call an adverb of manner. It tells us how we did an action, in what way. She ate it. How? Quickly. Okay? And adverbs of manner have different rules. So, usually they go in front of the verb. Not always, but they should. She quickly ate the pizza. Okay? We shouldn't say, she ate quickly the pizza. Right? It should go in front of the verb. But if you're not sure, that's not a bad choice. This choice is better than that. Because if your sentence has two verbs, putting an adverb at the end causes confusion. We don't know which verb it applies to. Now, for another example of that is this. We have this adverb of time. This is an adverb of time. It tells us when an action happened. Now, time can go at the beginning of the sentence or at the end. It doesn't really matter. I like it at the, at the beginning. But if it's at the beginning, it's going to apply to this verb and that verb. It's going to cover the whole sentence. And that's okay, right? Because quickly applies to eat, but yesterday applies to both actions. Both actions happened yesterday. That's why this is the good position for the time adverb. So, now, that's not the whole story of adverbs, Chris. It's not the full lesson of adverbs. But that's just one way to think, start thinking about adverbs. Um, perhaps you and I can discuss later. Uh, I can show you some uh, uh, different videos from past shows with more detailed explanations. Okay, um, let's have a look at this question. I'm just going to clean up the board again. Uh, where's my stuff? Yep. One thing I've noticed, guys, one thing I'd like to see this year with this show, I would like to have more English teachers watching the show. Because there's English teachers, there are English teachers all over the world. English teachers from different countries. And, you know, I'm a, an English teacher from a native English-speaking country, Canada. And a lot of native, a lot of English teachers from non-native English countries are often worried that they're not going to be good teachers or that companies won't hire them because they think they're not good teachers. I think that's really wrong. I think there are great teachers all around the world. It doesn't matter what your first language is. Mine happens to be English. That's irrelevant. I've met teachers from every country who grew up in that country, and they're great English teachers. However, because I've lived with English my entire life, sometimes I know little details that an English teacher from another country might not know. So I really love to help. Uh, students from uh, different countries. Okay. Let's first answer a simpler question. Let's... Uh, now, I'm not sure... That you're, you seem to be a new viewer, so welcome to the show. But I'm not sure how I should pronounce your name. Iliam? Iliam Bulgait? And, and what country are you in? Really curious. Welcome to the show. This is a good question. And I think I can answer it quickly. Um, tense communicates time. It communicates when an action happened. Okay? Now, there's two ways of looking at this in English. There's past tense and there's present tense. There are two times. That's not the full story, but that's one way to think about it. English doesn't really have a future tense. We use present tense grammar, and we push it into the future. So, you know, logically, in our human world, we think about three tenses. We think about the past time, we think about present time, and we think about future time. Three times. But in terms of grammar, it gets a little more complicated, right? We can think of simple past. Right? I ate pizza yesterday. 
It happened. We can think about present perfect. We can think about past perfect. The perfects are a way of combining the past and the present together, right? The word perfect in English, grammar, really means past. That's the meaning of it. If something is perfect, it's because it's complete. If it's complete, it's in the past. It was completed in the past. So past perfect, for example, is a way of merging the past with the past. Present perfect is a way of connecting the past to the present. We have a simple present, right? We use that for uh, habits and routines and general facts, right? It rains a lot in my city. Rains. Not today, but generally it rains in my city. It's a general fact, but it might not be happening now. Or we can talk about our hobbies, right? I, I run in the park every day. I run in the park. But if something is happening right now, we have something called present continuous. Right? Or some textbooks call it progressive. I am standing here right now. And this means it's happening right now, not always, not like simple present, which is always kind of true. Present continuous is happening right now only, and it's also temporary. I am standing right now, but I won't stand forever. I didn't stand all day. I started standing one hour ago, and I will end in another, I don't know, 30 minutes. So present continuous means right now and temporary. That's really important. So that's why I don't say, I am living in Canada. I've lived in Canada most of my life. It's not really temporary. It's kind of permanent. Instead, I will say, I live in Canada. It's my habit. It's general fact. So we have present continuous, progressive. And then in grammar, we start to think about how to talk about the future. So future tense, we have will, I will visit your country. We can use uh, I am going to plus a verb. I'm going to visit your country. Uh, am visiting your country. Uh, I visit your country on Friday, for example. Right? So we kind of have four, there's another way to do it, but generally four ways to use the present. However, these are not truly tenses because the verb doesn't change in a special way. Instead, we use am going. Well, that's present continuous. Am visiting. That's present continuous. Even will, if we say I will visit, look at the verb. The verb didn't change. It's simple present or base form, actually. So, in English, we don't have a different tense for the future. We borrow present tense grammar and push it into the future. This one is base form, and we just add will, and will pushes it into the future. So, we can kind of say we have six tenses in English. Uh, you could also say we have six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. It doesn't really matter, but that's basically it. Ultimately, though, tense is communicating an action, a verb, and its relation to time, when something happened. And that's the important thing to understand. So rather than, uh, you know, memorizing how many tenses there are, or it, it's, it's good to know, it's more important to understand what each one means. Okay. Uh, we also have, I want to say hello to Jonas. Jonas, welcome to the show. Uh, Palavi and Jonas seem to know each other. Uh, I want to go back to another question. Uh, where is it now? Yeah, this one. And I'll, once again, I'll clear the board. So 
So Pallavi is asking about sentence structure and word order. This is a really important topic. It's really important, and I'll tell you why. Because different languages have different sentence order, right? Your language, so Pallavi is in India, and India has many languages. I'm not sure which one is your main language. But different languages have different structures. Just for example, now I don't know much about India langu Indian languages, but I have studied Japanese languages. Japanese languages has a basic structure of subject, object, verb. So for example, if I, if I make a Japanese sentence, I might say, I, pizza, like. That's not English. So if you translate the Japanese words directly, you're going to have a strange sentence. English works like, I like, oops, pizza, right? And that's a subject, and that's a verb, and that's my object. That's the basic structure of English. Now, I say basic because from there it gets more complicated, right? As you know, I'm sure. But this is an example of why it's important to understand the structure. <clears throat> now, from that basic structure, we can do a lot of things. And one thing you should know, you probably know this because you might find English confusing. One of the reasons English is confusing is because the structure is very flexible. <laughs> it's very flexible. It, and that can be confusing when you're learning it. However, it also means, because it's flexible, it means we don't have to strictly follow structures and rules. If it's flexible, you can move it around, you can change it, you can twist it. And that means you can be creative with it. And I think that's one of the things I like about English. I don't like English because it's my language. I love all kinds of languages. But English has also produced a lot of poetry and beautiful music and lyrics because it can be twisted and, and made uh, into many different structures. Now, when you're learning, that makes it confusing. I do understand that. Uh, so what can we do here? Well, I, we don't have time to go into all detail, but let's look at a few things. So subject, I. So the subject is usually first, right? But you can also move it around, right? Um, you can make a passive. You can say, the pizza is something that I like, right? So what can be a subject? Well, a subject is usually a noun. Oops, let's make it red. Subject is usually a noun, but it's a noun form. So inside noun forms can be a single noun, like I, or pizza, single nouns. It could be a gerund, Right? Uh, you can start a sentence with a gerund like um, eating, oops, eating, eating. It's not a verb now, it's a noun form called a gerund. Eating is fun. Okay, you can start with a gerund, that's the subject. There's not a person there, there's the name of an activity is now the subject. So you can have a gerund, you can have a noun phrase such as uh, uh, in the park or eating in the park, let's say that, eating in the park. Eating in the park is fun. Now this whole thing is your subject, the whole idea, and the idea is made of a gerund a preposition, an article, and a noun. That's a noun phrase. You can have a noun clause as the subject. And a clause needs a subject and a verb. So for example, um, uh, that the chef made pizza Uh, 
got people talking. It's a longer sentence. Okay, but this whole clause, and it's a clause because we have a subject and a verb inside it, this whole thing is now the subject. It's a whole idea. That the chef made pizza got people talking. Right, and now there's the verb, and there's the rest of the sentence. So, the subject can be a lot of different things, usually nouns. There's a way to make it a verb, right? You can use infinitive verb in subject positions. Infinitive verb is not a noun, it's a verb, but it can be used in that position. We can also use empty subjects. We can use words like there or it, right? We could say, there is pizza. And in that case, there is not really a subject, but it's, it's, an, it's an empty or dummy subject. It's a substitute subject because we have to have something. In English, we can't say, like pizza. English needs a subject. Some languages don't. I'm not 100% sure, but I think in Spanish or Portuguese, you don't always need a subject. You can say things like, uh, uh, was fun. Was fun. Verb, adjective. Where's the subject? Can't do that in English. Need a subject. And you can say, the party was fun, or you can say, it was fun, but you need a subject. Some languages don't. So it's really important, first of all, to understand the structure of your language so that you can understand how it's different than English when you're learning English. So I would always suggest learners try to explain to me what's the basic structure of your language. Because once we know that, we can compare it to the English you're learning and see the differences that you need to be careful with. Now that's just the subject. You just asked me earlier, one of you asked me earlier about the verb tenses. As you can see, there are a lot of different tenses for the verb and forms. And that's going to change the sentence. But usually it's going to come after the subject because in English, we create an idea by expressing a subject did something. Sometimes a subject did something to an object. Sometimes a subject just did something like, yeah, I slept. Yeah, I slept. No object, I just slept. That's an intransitive verb. Doesn't need an object. Like needs an object. Okay? Remember the Japanese sentence I wrote, I the pizza like. Can't do that in English because you can't just have a verb stopping there. Right? You need to like something. So we don't have time for a full discussion about uh, sentence structure. However, if you can think of me some... Uh, really specific examples, we can look at it closely next show. Or I can prepare a longer lesson about sentence structure for you. Because we just, as you see, I just mentioned about the subject. We still need to talk about transitive or intransitive verb forms. Does it need an object? And if it doesn't, what can come after it? Right? Because sometimes if we change the verb, let's say, if this was not an action, if we change the verb to a be verb, like, um, let's hang on a second here. If you change it to a be verb, like it was, then you could have an object here. You could say it was a pizza. But you could also put an adjective there. You could say it was fun. The party was fun. Fun's an adjective. With a be verb, you have a whole new possibilities of what can come after it. Um, so that's a really good topic. We can look at that in more detail. Yeah. When you're a beginner, you're taught simple grammar structures and simple, simple grammar rules. And that's important because you don't have the language skill yet to really understand deeply things. You just need to get it into your brain. You need to learn the structures first. But I think most of you guys are past intermediate stage. Some of you are advanced learners. At that point, you also need to start learning about meaning. Because, as I've said a hundred times, why is grammar important? Not to pass a test. And there are some teachers who think grammar is not important. But as you can imagine, I think it's very important. Otherwise, why would I call myself grammar detective? 
it's important because specific grammar structure communicates specific meaning. Change the structure, change the meaning. You don't want that. You want to be able to control the meaning so that when you communicate to your friend, you communicate the exact meaning that's in your mind. That's why grammar is important. Grammar is the delivery system for your ideas, for your meanings. So if you can't control the grammar, you can't control the meaning. And if you can't control the meaning, nobody will understand you. Or worse, they'll understand the wrong meaning. Right? Imagine trying to make an appointment with someone for the future, for next week. I will meet you at 5 p.m. Friday. But you don't know how to use verb tense, so you use past tense because someone taught you it. So you say, I met you Friday at 5 p.m. Well, that's in the past. So when you're ready to meet your friend next week, they will not be there because they thought you were talking about the past. Right? So grammar is important. Now, teachers can debate, teachers can discuss how to teach grammar. Of course, there's many ways to teach grammar, and they're always changing. And we have always have new technology and new techniques for teaching grammar. And we should always try new techniques, whatever is going to help a student develop good grammar. But there are some people who believe a student never needs to learn grammar. I don't think that's realistic. I don't think we can develop a language ability without understanding somehow how to use the grammar. Because if you can't use the grammar, you can't control the meaning you communicate. And by the way, it also means you cannot understand what you hear. Not just what you say or what you write, but what you hear or what you read. If you can't understand the grammar structures and what they communicate, you'll be confused. That's a problem. That's a problem. Well, Pallavi, then this show is for you because I created this show to help people understand grammar better and better. That's what this is for. Uh, that's what all of my videos are for. There are some great teachers out there who can help you speak better English, pronounce English. Lots of teachers make videos uh, about uh, how to pronounce uh, words and sounds better. Uh, my friend Eric makes a weekly live stream and videos that teaches teachers how to uh, classroom tips, how to teach. But this show is for grammar. A lot of teachers don't enjoy teaching grammar. I do. I love grammar. I love structure and sentence and little funny twists and turns and tips. So the purpose of my show is to help people like you who feel that grammar is a weakness. So um, I'm happy to hear that. You uh, can learn from this show. And I thank you for watching because... Uh, Oh, here's an interesting thing. So, in your language, subject, object, verb. So that's very similar to Asian languages like Japanese. Yeah. Well, guys, we don't have much time left. And I have to be strict because, as I told you, I had some operation on my knee. And standing up, it will start to hurt after a while. So, so Chris lives in Belgium. In Flanders, lots of teachers don't teach much grammar. I have luck to know you, Teacher Paul. Thank you, Chris. That's very kind. I understand that. I've met a lot of teachers. I've worked with a lot of teachers. And they don't like teaching grammar for a lot of reasons. Some don't understand grammar very well, even native English speakers. And that's okay. They have other strengths and other specialties. Some teachers don't like teaching grammar because they think it's not necessary. They think a student just needs to learn how to speak or to practice listening or to pass a test. Some teachers don't like teaching grammar because uh, they don't have good techniques for it. For a lot of reasons. Maybe I'm unusual. There are other people who do. But I love teaching grammar. I love examining it. Or what I call investigating it. This show works best. I work best when you guys can give me a sentence that you don't understand and I can help you understand it. A sentence or a paragraph. That's when this show is the best. When someone sends me a video with a sentence example, 
right? Like the one I told you, I told you earlier about seeking. Um, where was it now? This is where my show works best. When you can give me a sentence, a full sentence example that is causing trouble for you, that you don't understand, or you don't understand why it's wrong or why it's right. Because, you know, we only have an hour for the show. So it's hard to give a whole lesson about something like structure. It's too big. But if we can look at a sentence example, we can get a lot of information out of that. So I would encourage you guys, during the week, when we're not together, and you hear examples, write them down. And then ask me when we're on the show. Save your examples, your English mysteries. Save them up. And uh, we'll explore them on the show. So once again, before we leave, guys, I want to ask you, if you haven't answered already, I'm going to, you know, uh, look at the information here and make some decisions about days and times. But if you haven't answered already, please tell me which day and which time in your country is best for you watching the show. In my country, right now, it is Thursday evening, Thursday at 6 p.m. So that might be different for you. This might not be the best time. I want to know what is the best time for you because maybe I'll change it to that time. Because I do want, I do want the most people to watch this. Oh, this is very sweet. Thank you. I usually don't wake up early in the morning. I'm fully awake now after listening to your voice. I'm grateful to found you, uh, Teacher Paul. Good. Thank you. And by the way, it should be, I am grateful to have found you because this is simple past, found, uh, but it has no relationship to the present. We need present perfect to mix them. You have found me, so you found me in the past, but that affects the present because now we're together, right? Present perfect connects the past action. You found me in the past, but now the fact that you found me in the past affects your present, right? Now, you're listening to my voice. Now we're together. So you should say, I'm grateful to have found you. Very good. Thank you very much for that comment. I really appreciate it. Okay, guys, I think I better get going uh, and rest my leg. I'm very, very happy to start streaming again with you guys. And I hope I cleared up some of your English mysteries. I know we didn't have a lot of time for it tonight. So think about your specific questions or strange sentences that you want to investigate. And on the next show, next week, we will do that again. Before we go, I want to say once more, one more time, if you feel generous and you want to help support the show, which does cost me money to produce, you can go to buy me a copy, buy me a coffee and donate any amount of money, a dollar, two dollars, five, whatever. It all helps cover the cost of producing the show. Because I do not want this show to be subscription or uh, a fee. I want this to be free for you. But it costs a lot of money to produce it every week. So if you can, if you feel generous, at least consider donating to the show. And if you really want, you can buy Grammar Detective or Hard Boiled English products uh, at the online store. You can buy English Weirdness products, all of my video series. You can buy notebooks, right? Uh, notebook series with all of the different video series on it. There are t-shirts, there are hooded sweatshirts, there are cell phone cases, caps, all kinds of stuff, if you want, okay? And again, all the cost goes to helping uh, produce the show. Thank you for joining the show, guys. I really appreciate it. Please tell your friends to join the show when they can. And follow me on social media because the times and days might change. I'm trying to find the best day and time for the spring and summer. Okay, so keep, keep a close watch on it. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much. I will. Thank you for joining the show, guys. Now, the time is up, so I'm going to say goodbye. Keep learning English, guys, and until the next time I see you, stay healthy, 
take care of your legs. You don't want to have to have surgery on an injured knee. It's not, not fun. But until I see you next, guys, keep learning English. Think of your English mystery questions. And until I see you then, stay cool. Thanks for watching tonight's show. If you have an English grammar question, an English mystery, contact me on social media and send me a video of you asking the question. I'll investigate it on a future show. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button to get all the updates about videos and events. If you're feeling generous, you can also donate to the production costs of the show at Patreon or buy me a coffee. Finally, until the next time I see you on Hard Boiled English Live, I want you to keep learning English. Stay healthy and stay cool.